hugging robots, banishing cues, and increasing our influence. Plus this day in history with Firing Dave Mustaine and our song of the day by Future Islands on Your Morning Monarchy for April 11th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. And thank you so much for joining us for another blast of listener-supported media. A couple seconds after 9 a.m. coming to you, as always, from the MediaMonarchy.com studios up here in the Pacific Northwest. And we are broadcasting live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. A huge thanks to RadioConfluence.com for simulcasting all of your Media Monarchy broadcasts, your Morning Monarchy, your Pump Up the Volume, and your Good News Next Week and New World Next Week audio versions as well. A huge thanks as well, speaking of as wells, to the Truth Seeker app. They carry your Morning Monarchy each and every morning, and that gets us up alongside some of the bigger alternative media shows, and hopefully you'll spread the word about this show. We are brought to you by you, and a huge thanks to all our supporters and subscribers and donors and cheerleaders and everybody. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the PayPal, the Patreon, the Bitcoin, the snail mail, any number of ways that you can give a little, and I can give a lot. A huge thanks to our latest patrons at Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy. That's Saeedy C. and Todd B. MediaMonarchy.com slash support is the place to give us that monthly support that I need to keep going and growing and moving and grooving. I can budget on it. The way it is set up is monthly support. Give as little as a dollar a month. That keeps us going. And we'll continue to build up some of the other subscriber levels as we're working on behind-the-scenes action. Would love to do like a monthly subscriber hangout. Looking for the right platform to do that kind of place. That kind of thing. I don't know that Google Hangouts is the exact place for that. I hear of lots of other platforms. And there's Discord and some other places. And of course, what do I see as I sign into Mixler this morning? And that's the place where we originate these broadcasts from. It was basically a free service that gave you a free hour and then it shuts you off after an hour. And that's perfect. That's all I needed. I do an hour of news in the morning, an hour of music in the afternoon, and I basically turn it on this morning and it basically says, yeah, you're going to have to start paying us starting May 17th. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to happen there, Mixler. I just so happen to have been working on my own stream over the weekend. It will be hosted on my server. And it'll still be at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We might work on putting the chat. Maybe that might be for subscribers only. Again, these are things just kind of kicking around, looking at the best ways to make Media Monarchy the powerhouse that it can be. On much better news, I made cookies the other night so good. <laughs> I don't make cookies very often. I just generally am mostly the dinner cooker, but I'm glad I, I branched out and made some cookies. And, you know, again, we're, we're catching up here at home. Cassie was away for weeks and weeks and weeks. This is the longest time she and I had really ever been apart in the last dozen years. So we're working on plants on the balcony, which you can see if you check out the latest episode of Good News next week. I'll talk about that at the end of this episode. And we also headed out over Saturday night to the latest installment of what's called Tesla City Stories. I talked about it last month, and it's basically live, old-style radio done on a stage. And it's basically a theater troupe here in Portland. They put on shows as though they were from the 1940s. So it's nice to get dressed up and go do that on a Saturday night, as I hope, again, there's a lot of awful things going on. I talked about, you know, in some ways feeling like, oh, I missed out. I wasn't on the air when the missiles started flying. As, again, was noted in the chat yesterday, eh, probably spending time with your family and loved ones is going to be a little more important. I was laughing. <laughs> Like lots of Simpsons things, I forget, they're maybe watching a movie clip or it's some kind of flashback clip, but it's basically something in the old Roman era. And as a guard gets stabbed with a spear, he's falling over and he says, I should have gone to more orgies. You don't want to be saying that when you die. And I don't think I want to be saying, oh, if only I would have blogged a little bit more. That would have made all the difference, right? It wouldn't. We are trying to learn our way forward. And I'm glad that we can do it in kind of a fear-free way, in a friend-building, community-building way. Now, again, I'm on Skype and Wire as Media Monarchy, and I always love hearing from you, James, at MediaMonarchy.com. Hey, it is your Morning Monarchy for Tuesday, Tech Tuesday, April 11th, 2017. Again, coming to you from the Media Monarchy studios. Tuesday is Cyberspace War Day, and we will get into all the news from inner space and outer space as soon as we glance at the breaking lamestream news. Oh, man, the defense stocks are... That rally is starting to teeter as Trump's 
planes encounter reality. Missiles start to fly. Docks when the missiles start to fly. South Korea seeks to assure citizens U.S. won't strike north preemptively. I saw some tweet this morning. It said, if you, know, you want to take over North Korea without firing a shot, just open their borders and give them video games and soda and porn. United Airlines, of course, still going through their massive PR disaster. We talked about that yesterday. It's just, again, it just makes it that much easier to not use your service. We also had, of course, more shooter events yesterday. Things seem to generally start to break out. So I do the morning show, Morning Monarchy, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Pacific Time at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Then two hours later, at noon Pacific Time, I do Pump Up the Volume, the daily DJ set at noon. It is also a live hour. Oftentimes it seems when we get into the Pump Up the Volume show, that's when the day's news really starts to rattle around and we start to hear all these horrible breaking news stories. I'm not sure if Lauren Coleman has any sinks or interesting Twilight language concerning the latest San Bernardino shooting. We will possibly talk about that on Thursday, that being Holy Hex's Day. Rexon Tillerson warns Russia on Syria, saying Assad era is coming to an end. As the swamp just gets on fuller. So I wanted to start this episode out with, I believe, what's going to be the cover art of this episode. And it's all about how humans are suckers when it comes to anthropomorphizing and subsequently caring for robots. Anthropomorphizing is when you see human faces in other things. You know, like when you look at your light socket switch, oh, it's like two little eyes and a mouth going, oh. We see ourselves in everything and want to see ourselves in everything. Some of us want to love robots so badly we wind up shedding tears over a hunk of metal that was sent hurtling through space a million miles away, like the filet comet lander saying goodbye to the European State Space Agency. But love is messy and blind, and so often we look past a cold, rigid truth like that robot is, in fact, just a broken water heater. That's the case in the radioactively adorable video, which is titled, Raina Meets a Robot. It is early, but it might be one of the big 2017 viral hits of the year. It's got just about everything you could hope for in a 24-second video clip. A darling main character, she calls it Wobot. Wonderful rising action and just the right amount of existential dread, you know? And she hugs it. I love you, Wobot. And, then, and as the video ends, she starts to run over to a manhole cover. I'm not sure what she would see in that. These kids today, they're going to know a world more full of robots than any of us old suckers can imagine. But the real question that is asked by Verge, which is where we grab this article, and again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes, and you can watch this 24-second video of learning to love the robot. The real question is, will all those kids still love the robots when all those robots start taking all your jobs? So there's a big choice coming up. It's already here for a lot of us. Some of us have already faced down this decision. And we're lucky enough to be in a position to say, hey, you know what? In the words of Morrissey, I've never had a job because I've never wanted one. Some workers have been implanted with microchips that allow the companies that employ them to track their every move. This coming out of News Australia. Dateline April 4th, 2017. Now remember that date. Swedish company Epicenter will embed a chip into about 150 workers so bosses can monitor toilet breaks and how long they work. I guess those are two separate things. Gotta have a little stinker tinker time. The workers volunteered to have the microchip, which is, of course, as we know, from 15 years of propaganda, about as big as a grain of rice, implanted for free. Patrick Mesterton, Mesterton, co-founder, chief executive of Epicenter. They're an innovation and technology company. Ooh, that sounds very, very specific and impressive. They told the Australian broadcasting company the microchips inserted into employees' hands would simplify life. 
With the radio frequency identification chip, they'll be able to open doors and use office technology like photocopiers. And it can even pay for chemical lunch at the office cafe. You can do airline fares with it. You can also go to your local gym. So it basically replaces a lot of things you have other communication devices for, whether it be credit cards or keys or things like that. Two years ago, Mr. Mesterton told news.com.au many of Epicenter's employees had already been chipped and used the technology in their everyday life two years ago. It's an implant in the hand that enables them to digitize professional information and communicate with the devices both personal and within Epicenter. Once chipped with this technology, members can interact with the building with a simple swipe of the hand. Chips can also be programmed to hold contact information and talk to smartphone apps. Because I know you guys, you're really lacking in your life a lot of building communication. I really wish I could interact with a building more. Said no one ever before 9-11. These types of microchips have been used in humans and lowly animals before. It means people don't need to keep track of all those multiple passwords. I mean, I couldn't possibly be asked to remember simple sets of numbers. Jesus Christ. It'll all just be on a chip. Emma Lance had a microchip implanted under her skin about three years ago and told the Swedish newspaper, The Local, it wasn't the future. This is the present. To me, it's weird we haven't seen this sooner. Mr. Mesterton told the ABC the idea wasn't that far-fetched as people had been implanting devices under their skin for decades, including things like pacemakers. That's a way, way more serious thing than having a small chip that can actually communicate with devices. You know, stupid pace. All it's doing is keeping your grandpa alive. That's bullshit. Microbiologist Ben Liberton from Swedish University Karolinska Institute told the ABC the chip could compromise security and hold a lot of private information. Conceptually, you could get data about your health, you could get data about your whereabouts, how often you're working, how long you're working, if you're taking toilet breaks, and things like that. All of that data could conceivably be connected. Collected, I should say. Yeah. Yeah connecting the dots that comes later so the question is what happens to it afterwards what's it used for who's going to be using it who's going to be seeing it and let's find out why they planted a microchip in their hand 24 hours ago i had a chip implanted in my hand what i want you to do mm-hmm. is just take a knife and slowly blow it Help. And it's going to allow me to open doors and it can operate the lifts. Going down. going down indeed. And it will allow me to interact with any system in the digital world. For instance, when I wave my phone over it, it can transfer my virtual business card. But it can be a little bit tricky. Error. 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 Move. This technology has been going into our pets since the 1970s. But I can see the future is now, and I can see everyone getting one of these. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history. In the but year thanks 2017. Thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. I can see you asking yourselves already, why would I do this? Well, one word, convenience. Why should I have five cards in my wallet when I can replace it all with one chip in my hand? And all you have to do is give away your entire humanity. You know, not not a big choice. You know, like Jella Biafra told us many decades ago, give me convenience or give me death. Now here's the really interesting part, and we see this a lot of the times doing this work that we do. It's not uncommon for... Corbin and I to be collating stories that we're going to talk about on New World next week, and one or the other of us will finally go, hey, that story, you know, that's from three years ago. Or even from six months ago. Stories sometimes make the rounds again, and you wonder, why is this story coming back out? And you double-check the date, and you go, no, like I said, April 4th, 2017. So the interesting part in that article which again comes from news.com.au, notes that two years ago, 
Mr. Mesterton told News.com.au. Many of Epicenter's employees had already been shipped and used the technology in their everyday life, and indeed they had. An office in Sweden is taking wearable technology to the next level by implanting microchips into their staff. Yes, that's right. The newly opened Epicenter office complex in Stockholm is offering workers the chance to be chipped under the skin of their hands. The radio frequency identification chip, which is about the size of a grain of rice, allows users to open doors, swap contact details and use the photocopier. Uh, it felt pretty scary, but at the same time it feel, felt very modern, very 2015. The chipping is entirely voluntary and, according entirely. to manufacturers, it's completely safe. So some of the future areas of use, I think, like anything where you today would use a PIN code or a, or, or a, or a key or a card. So payments is, I think, one area. Uh, I think also for healthcare reasons that you can sort of uh, uh, communicate with your doctor and, and you can get data on what you eat and, and, and sort of what your uh, physical status. Uh, you have your own identification code and you're sending that to something else which you have to grant access to. So there's no one else that can sort of follow you on your uh, ID, so to say. It's you who decide who gets access to that ID. Uh, in other news, your W-2 will now come as a suppository. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Tech Tuesday, April 11th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Swedish office epicenter implants microchips in employees' hands. That clip right there, originally from February 16th, 2015. So now why the big update? It's not like... ABC News here says, oh, we are doing a follow-up on a story from two years ago, and we want to see how it goes. It just seems like another commercial for the microchip implantation agenda. And we've talked a million times, Clyde Lewis talked about this a lot. It's really not going to, you're not going to need a chip. It's pretty much just going to be your biometrics. The chip is just sort of the gateway drug, if you will. And I find it really interesting how much they continually come back to the photocopier. Won't somebody please think of the photocopier? Now, I don't know about you, but the last office I worked in, maybe they do need microchips to operate the photocopier, because from what I can tell, the morons didn't even know how to put new reams of paper in it. This is the world that we're living in. Oh, it's so convenient. It's so convenient for a systematically dumbed-down society that can barely walk down the sidewalk. So I suppose it's, it shouldn't come as much surprise. Like the same people who couldn't program a VCR clock are going to figure this shit out. That's why all the Internet of Things are all so hackable. That's why poor duped morons are putting smart bulbs in their place. Of course, you know, being hacked. All of it's going to be hacked. All of it's going to be let out. So until we reach the time when, oh, sweet, I'm an Eloy on the, on the top. You know, then I, then I might have a microchip. Or we'll be toiling away in the salt mines below, like the little ugly Morlocks we might all be, right? So I'm putting together a little bit of a, a future story for you here with the handful of articles we're first going over on your Tech Tuesday Brits, as the Telegraph writes, are well known for their love of queuing. But the prospect of standing in line while out shopping is soon to become a memory of a bygone era. A quarter of shops are planning to do away with queuing altogether within four years by letting customers pay for items using their smartphones by 2021, according to a survey of Britain's biggest retailers. Transactions at traditional, manned, stationary point-of-sale checkout are in free fall with the proportion falling from 71% in 2012 to 52% in 2017. The move by stores is in part a response to that goddamn Brexit. Retail consultants at Zebra, which conducted the research, said by getting rid of tills and staff, retailers will be able to cut costs at a time when they're seeing their margins squeezed as a result of the falling value of the pound and rising commodity prices. So because the economy is rigged and based on debt... Gosh, we just can't make this casino continue to work. So we're going to fire all the Morlocks who were making the machinery roll along. 
Household name stores, including Waitrose and Zara, are already installing high-tech payment and security systems, which are likely to evolve into fully queueless systems over the coming years. Zara, which is a store I've not heard of. Maybe it's Zara. I'm your name mangler. Yes, the Eloy were also food for the Morlocks. That's a great point. We will still get to munch on yummy, delicious, blonde Morlocks in the future. <laughs> Zara has installed high-tech clothing tags, which let staff know where they are in stores. Won't somebody please think of the blouses I have misplaced? However, these could eventually be used to let customers scan garments and pay for them using their vending machines, which are smartphones as we've called them for years, and we took that phrase from Cryptagon. He called it many years ago. It's like, they want you walking around with a vending machine. That's why all the ports, that's why all the holes, that's why all the interaction parts have all been stripped away from all your devices. It's just a vending machine for you to go, bloop, Alexa, buy me some fucking cookies and a dollhouse, or whatever it was. The latest mobile devices for self-scanning use Bluetooth technology to detect what a customer has just scanned. This also allows the retailer to know where customers are in store and provide contextual information, such as, don't forget, that product is part of a special offer. Mark Thompson, not the former BBC, now New York Times guy who somehow has an amazing knack for covering up institutional child abuse. This is a different Mark Thompson, I believe. He's the director of retail and hospitality at Zebra Technologies. He said, quote, in five years, a visit to the British High Street will be massively different from today. Retailers want to put more power into the hands of shoppers, letting them pay with their mobiles as they browse or giving them smart carts with screens and built-in scanning. The store itself will continue to get smarter as well. Retailers will be able to tell when and where specific customers are in the store. They keep mentioning that part. They really want to know where you are in the store, right? And this is all about maintaining the profits of stores we all stopped going to. So yes, of course, the economy is phony baloney rigged zeros and ones based on debt and run by private central international banksters. So they are kind of right when they talk about funny money and inflation and all that stuff. But the other part they're not talking about is how we've stopped going to those places. We've stopped eating your garbage food and we've stopped buying your made-in-China chemical crap. That's what's tightening a lot of the belts. That's, of course, even what's happening back here to, of course, Sears, which we've talked about recently on New World Next Week. So we're putting these stories all together, and I think they basically tell the tale not of the future, but just as that poor microchip implanted sucker was saying, this is the present. And there's a lot of choices to make right now. you got to figure out which, which ladder you might want to climb or not. So as I said, I love getting news from you. I love hearing from you out there, james at mediamonarchy.com. I can't always keep up with who sends me what where. I suppose it's always the easiest way. If you hit me up on Twitter, of course, I'll immediately tag you on that. But in this case, I got a video sent to me by our buddy Chef Jake, my neighbor to the north up in Washington. It's a video that's about a 20-minute long thing, and I actually I listened to the whole thing, as I advise you to as well. It's not much to look at. You can just have it playing while you putter around and do what other things you might be into doing. But I think it sort of shows where, in some ways, where we are in the employment, in the new employment world order. And some of the fights that we're having, again, you know, against each other. Everything feels like it's getting squishy and, and packed in here in our overpacked metropolis. But there's a guy called Simon Sinek. And I'll tell you a little bit about him afterwards. But I just want to play a couple of minutes of talking about not only this sort of new world work order, but more specifically, as Simon Sinek is going to talk about, that is millennials in the new work order. Uh, I have yet to give a speech or have a meeting where somebody doesn't ask me the millennial question. Um, What's the millennial question? Apparently millennials as a generation, which is a group of people who were born approximately... Uh, 1984 and after um, uh, are tough to manage 
and they're accused of being entitled and narcissistic and self-interested, unfocused, lazy. <laughs> but entitled is the big one. And, uh, and because they confound leadership so much, what's happening is leaders are asking the millennials, what do you want? And millennials are saying, we want to work in a place with purpose, love that. Um, we want to make an impact, you know, whatever that means. Um, uh, we want free food and bean bags. Uh, and so somebody articulates some sort of purpose. There's lots of free food and there's bean bags. And yet, for some reason, they are still not happy. And that's because um, you, the, they're missing, there's, there's, a, there's a missing piece. Um, what I've learned is that there, I can break it down into four pieces, right? There are four, four things, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies, you know? Where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time, they were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it, right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. And some of them got A's not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Some kids got participation medals. You got a medal for coming in last, right? Which the science we know is pretty clear, which is it devalues the medal and the reward for those who actually work hard. And it actually makes the person who comes in last feel embarrassed because they know they didn't deserve it, so it actually makes them feel worse, mm. right? So you take this group of people, and they graduate school, and they get a job, and they're thrust into, an, into the real world, and in an instant, they find out they're not special, their moms can't get them a promotion, um, that you get nothing for coming in last, and by the way, you can't just have it because you want it, right? And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. The other problem, to compound it, is we're growing up in a Facebook, Instagram world. In other words, we're good at putting filters on things. We're good at showing people that life is amazing even though I'm depressed, right? And so everybody sounds tough, and everybody sounds like they got it all figured out. And the reality is there's very little toughness, and most people don't have it figured out. And so when the more senior people say, well, what should we do? They sound like, this is what you got to do. And they have no clue. <laughs> You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. You are listening to your Morning Monarchy for Tech Tuesday. It's Cyberspace War Day. We call it April 11th, 2017. Coming to you, as always, from the Media Monarchy studios. And we were just listening to a couple of minutes of Simon Sinek on Millennials in the Workplace, at which point he would go on to talk about maybe you shouldn't have your phone, maybe we shouldn't have our phones all charging by our heads. And in some ways, as was pointed out by the chat, millennials are the children you failed to raise. There's a lot of questions, a lot of choices we're all being faced with. Now I look at this dude, and you can go to his Wikipedia page, and yeah, again, we're all joking in the chat that we all, of course, missed our, missed our millions. It's like, oh, there's an entire industry of baby boomers and Gen Xers describing the generations after them. <laughs> could, have, could have got into that world. Been making millions by now, wearing cool glasses and stuff. The whole 20-minute piece, Millennials in the Workplace, is interesting and worth checking out. And then I also look and find that Simon Sinek is, of course, also making tons of money being a consultant for places like Disney, Microsoft, the U.S. military. Not that there's a hell of a lot of difference between any of those places. All pretty similar. So that's a look at your new employment world order. Not a pretty picture, is it? Not exactly something it sounds like you want to take much part in. And we're just going to see the building up of this giant centralization in these giant urban death mazes known as compact cities. But at the same time, you're seeing the pushback, the pull away, the decentralization. 
and you're seeing pay- places not firing all their staff because they can't afford that and also the inflated price of Chotsky's, you're seeing people hire staff. So let's continue to look around the cyberspace war world. As even Reuters notes, Symantec attributes 40-plus cyber attacks, you know, to CIA-linked hacking tools. Security researcher Symantec Corp. said on Monday that past cyber attacks on scores of organizations around the world were conducted with top-secret hacking tools that were exposed recently by the web publisher WikiLeaks. That means the attacks were likely conducted by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. The files posted by WikiLeaks appear to show internal CIA discussions of various tools for hacking into phones, computers, and other electronic gear, along with programming code for some of them, and multiple people familiar with the matter have told Reuters that the documents came from the CIA or its contractors. The CIA has not confirmed the WikiLeaks documents are genuine. Past cyber attacks on scores of organizations around the world were conducted with top secret hacking tools that were exposed recently by the web publisher WikiLeaks, so says Symantec. That means the attacks were likely conducted by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. The files posted by WikiLeaks appear to show internal CIA discussions of various tools for hacking into phones, computers, and other electronic gear, along with programming code for some of them. And multiple people familiar with the matter have told Reuters that the documents came from the CIA or its numerous tentacles of contractors, which, as we've talked about in the many years in the past, that's really how they conduit a lot of these false flag events and attacks and ops. Symantec said it had conducted at least, or rather connected, at least 40 attacks in 16 countries to the tools obtained by WikiLeaks, though it followed company policy by not formally blaming the CIA. Things don't go well for you if you blame the CIA. The CIA has not confirmed the WikiLeaks documents are genuine, but agency spokeswoman Heather Fritz Horniak said that any WikiLeaks disclosures aimed at damaging the intelligence community, quote, not only jeopardize U.S. personnel and operations, but also equip our adversaries with tools and information to do us harm. And that's our job, assholes. (laughs) Yeah, you, you know, they create the enemies. Symantec attributes 40 cyber attacks to CIA-linked tools. We are fully in the era of, as Webster Tarpley coined it a decade ago, virtual flag terrorism. And this connects to most everything you see being hyped on the news, being used to get some sort of emotional response out of you. And then we blast off this rock as the United States Air Force may become a sort of space cop in the not-too-distant future. An off-Earth economy cannot truly take off unless moon miners and other pioneering entrepreneurs are able to operate in a safe and stable environment, so said Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Schilling of Air University. The U.S. Navy secures the freedom of action for commerce globally for the good of all mankind, and I think it's going to take a force very similar to that to provide the predictability and security that the marketplace of space will need, Schilling said two, no, one week ago today, April 4th, during a panel discussion at the 33rd National Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Spooktown, USA. I think that would be the role of the United States Air Force moving into the future. Somebody needs to secure and protect strategic choke points, such as lunar ice deposits and gravitationally stable spots near the moon where spacecraft can camp out without burning fuel. Fundamentally, I'd like that to be somebody with a value system that reflects the values that I share. I believe in the value of killing little kids for resources. Oh, wait, he doesn't say that. I believe in the value of individual property rights and the rule of law. (laughs) Whew, this stuff is good. I, you know, I can't make this up. United Launch Alliance CEO Tori Bruno moderated the panel, which featured Schilling. Off-World CEO Jim Caravola, Made in Space CEO Andrew Rush, and former NASA astronaut Sandy Magnus, Executive Director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. The panel focused on how activities in cis-lunar, 
that's the Earth Moon space, could help spur the establishment of a sustainable off Earth economy. The basic idea behind the ULA, United Launch Alliance led CIS Lunar 1000 plan. I thought CIS was just things we used to describe those weirdo gender things. <laughs> God, you're so CIS Lunar. I can't believe you'd said be interplanetarily bigoted. So they are very excited about becoming the space cops. I mean, we already throw our weight around all around the world and ensure that everything safely happens as they're patting themselves on the back. We need to be the space cop. Space.com is super excited about it. Next job for U.S. Air Force, space cop. Coming soon to a theater near you. Oh, wait, that's right. They already made that movie and no one cared. Now, we talked last week a little bit about ISPs, you know, selling your browsing history. Did we talked about that on New World Next Week? So, of course, there's the entire list of all the Congress critters who voted to do these sorts of things. And I forget who came up with the idea, who basically said it, but it always needs repeating. Those Congress critters should essentially have to wear NASCAR outfits to show what whores they work for. Or, or rather, what pimps they work for. They're the whores. And they're selling us out. So there's the giant list of all the senators who voted 50 to 48 to do away with broadband privacy rules. It was SJ Res 34, Senate Joint Resolution. So, of course, Shelley Moore Capito, Senator Republican out of my home state of West Virginia. Of course she voted for it. Orrin Hatch, Tom Cotton, Inhofe, McCain. It's just a giant list of who's who of fuckheads. But interestingly enough, on this list, there's that name. The Republican senator out of Georgia. His name's Senator David Perdue. He voted to let ISP sell your browsing history. Now, it's interesting because his brother just got a pretty sweet gig in the White House. His brother, Sonny, has just been appointed to the head of the Department of Agriculture. Now, I guess two weeks ago when I was on air, I insulted someone's favorite politician, Sonny Perdue, former governor of Georgia. Remember we played all those clips of everybody kissing his ass? Like, oh, you're I'm so glad you're here. And, oh, your family, so beautiful. I mean, news article said, confirmation hearing goes smoothly for Sonny Purdue. And I was told by a, a, a possible now former listener from Georgia, they kissed his ass because he's a good, honest man. Whoa, it, Really? Did I, did, I, did I insult your favorite politician? Which, of course, made me actually go read up on Sonny Purdue on his Wikipedia page. That's a Food World Order note, and we're going to dish that dirt tomorrow. Talk a little bit about Sonny Purdue. Maybe we'll make it a regular featured segment here. Exposing your favorite politician. So his brother, again, it's, it's the family biz. His brother voted to sell your ISP history. And tomorrow, we'll talk about the awesome, what's, wait, what is it? We'll talk about the good, honest man that Sonny Perdue is. I got to get the quotes exactly right. Now, as we start to wrap up this Cyberspace War edition, still some very important stories to go over. April 12th, that's tomorrow. That is a deadline. It's a deadline for V2X. Deadline looms for V2X communication rulemaking. A press release from Autotalks, an Israeli-based developer of V2X chipsets, breathlessly says V2V communication expected to be deployed in U.S. and new vehicles starting in 2019. Funding follows major design wins with leading Tier 1s and OEMs. So I grabbed this from EET India, and essentially this entire article is like, what is V2X? And I learned so many things by, again, hearing from you out there. 
V2X or V2V is vehicle-to-vehicle communication. Now, does that sound like a good idea? Let's go back now nearly three years and talk about the possible problems with V2X, vehicle-to-vehicle communication. Hey guys, it's Rylan here, 4 Wheel Online. I'm here to bring you the rundown of this week's most contentious story, vehicle-to-vehicle communication. Recently, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration released a research report on this new vehicle-to-vehicle technology, stating that it could prevent as many as 592,000 collisions per year. According to the report, this would also in turn help to save about 1,100 lives annually. Check out CBS's Jeff Pegasus' analysis of how the system works. In this demonstration, two cars up, the driver is about to slam on his brakes. We can't see it, but the car can. Sounds like it could be great, right? Well, the government definitely seems to think so. In fact, the government has deemed this technology so beneficial that there is now a plan being set in motion that would require all new vehicles to be equipped with V2V technology within about three years. But the push for this has raised a lot of eyebrows about privacy. Think about it. This mandatory new technology would put a tracker on your car that is sending messages out at all times. This, of course, has not been the government's only attempt at tracking our vehicles. Check out this. It's a license plate recognition device. Police can slap these things on their cars, capture the license plate of each and every car that passes by, and collect a treasure trove of information on drivers. And they're being used in California and Texas, and now other states are pushing for them. This particular device uh, tracks our license plates. It knows where we're going, how often we've been there, um, it can set, it can track our patterns of travel. Um, it can track who we travel with. Check out this video. Well, data recorders, also known as black boxes, are seen by some as valuable tools in investigating things like car accidents. And they're already in more than 90% of all new cars built today. But there are some growing concerns that these black boxes could give the government or could give companies too much access to your private information. Your insurance company, for example, could download data to determine your driving habits and charge you more based upon your compliance with traffic laws. If black boxes were to be overlaid with GPS information, authorities could potentially have a gold mine of information about you, where you've been, what you've been up to. Whoa, with each of these new unregulated advancements, like vehicle-to-vehicle technology, we are inching towards the chilling Big Brother society that we are warned about in Orwell's 1984. And pretty soon, between cell phones, Facebook, and cameras being put on every street corner, The privacy that we once took for granted will be completely gone. Now, that's a video from nearly three years ago, August 20th, 2014. The possible problems with V2X, vehicle-to-vehicle communication. Now, that's not just having the little rear-view mirror camera thing that'll go beep, 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 you're about to hit that car. It's much more than that. So, if you don't like being beaten and molested when you go fly the unfriendly skies, well, go, I'll just rent a car. Finally, there'll be a car where I can be smacked out on the knot on heroin and my car will continue to drive around. Again, there's another future. Possible future scenario. And they've been working on it a lot. They've been rushing it. And another, you know, this is just my own kind of tips. When you're looking at stories, go to that scene and see what those people are saying. You know I don't follow car news. But when I started to dig around, I found a site that basically, they love cars. They're all excited about it. Even regular gearheads are going to say, fuck this. I don't want Big Brother controlling my car. And what, it's going to come to the point where you're using Ukrainian software to hack your John Deere tractor? These are the choices. These are the situations we're being put in. Oh, speaking of hackers... We've seen hackers flooding 911, I'm sorry, 911 emergency services with rogue requests to knock their service offline for an entire state, but some hacking incidents are worse than others. One such incident took place in Dallas last Friday night when a hacker triggered a network of 156 emergency warning sirens for about 2 hours waking up residents and of course sparking fears of a disaster. Out of this story a search is underway for a hacker who caused panic and confusion in Dallas by triggering all of the city's emergency emergency sirens at the same time. The system was hacked just before midnight Friday. All 156 sirens in Dallas blared intermittently for more than an hour and a half. 
The 911 center was flooded with more than 4,400 calls from concerned residents. The sirens are intended to warn people of incoming severe weather. City officials said the hack originated in the Dallas area, and they are working with the Federal Communications Commission to look for a suspect. CBS News contributor Nicholas Thompson is editor-in-chief of Wired. Nick, good morning. Good morning, Norm. How could something like this happen? Well, we don't know exactly. They haven't said exactly how it was hacked, but there is an interesting trade-off which does explain it, which is that when you have a system like an emergency warning system, you want it to be pretty easy to operate, operate in a tough situation, which means you make it pretty simple to set off. So it also is something that's relatively simple to hack. What I think probably happened is they are activated by radio transmissions, most likely, and probably somebody figured out the frequency with which they're operated and figured out whatever encryption they use in Dallas and then set them off for whatever reason. And what would be their motivation? Well, one hypothesis is that it's just a kid doing a stunt. Another motivation is it's a disgruntled city employee trying to show how weak the system is. The most nefarious explanation would be it's somebody trying to cover up something else. You set off all the emergency sirens, mm. you jam 911, you can do whatever you want in a city. How vulnerable are our municipal infrastructures overall to this kind of hacking? I think quite vulnerable. And the reason is that you don't suspect someone is going to do it, right? You run a bank. You know people are going to try to steal the money, so you set up a lot of protections. You have a bunch of tornado warning sirens. You're not going <laughs> to yeah. think that somebody's going to go, oh, let's set off the tornado warning siren system because there's no reason to. So you don't really build up the defenses. You don't train the defenses. And then something like this happens. So how do you upgrade the security around this kind of infrastructure? Well, you have to change the encryption, right? So if it is a radio signal, again, we don't know that. That's not confirmed. But the fact that the FCC is investigating kind of suggests that it yeah. is. Um, so what you do is you have a better encryption key, right? So some signal is sent to the tower to set it off. Presumably you have some kind of encryption set to the time. You have some kind of special password or something. Maybe you set up another layer so it's a little harder to crack into what it is. Well, it's a sign of the times and too many people can hack too many things. Right, exactly. This is something we are going to see a lot more of. We've seen lots of attempts to try to hack it. What is so interesting here is they said it was somebody in Dallas. It was not somebody remote. So it wasn't somebody sitting in another country. It wasn't somebody sitting in New York saying, let's set off the Dallas systems. It's somebody in Dallas. They have confirmed that. They do know that. So that suggests it's not sort of a remote entry computer problem, which is what we keep seeing so frequently. My money is, of course, on the disgruntled employee. Uh, choice B in there. Now, our listener Libertas in the chat right now said he woke his ass up Friday night. And we can kind of laugh at it because it didn't happen in our town. I know. what? Why, yes, that was Mr. Bill Moyers there in the background. So I'm going to call that a little bit of good news and close with another couple of other bits of good news. When Mega Upload was raided in 2012, more than 1,100 servers were seized in the United States. In addition, 32 were targeted in Canada, and the battle to determine who can access them has continued ever since. The Ontario Court of Appeal has now decided that that will not be the Federal Bureau of... Informants blowing things up. FBI cannot examine mega upload servers. Canada appeals court rules. And the final little bit of good news notes actually surrounds around, you know, of course, not unmitigated good news. And it's how the alt-right brought Syria hoax to America, tracing the false flag claim back to a pro-Assad website. Now, I'm not going to get into propping up the system, or siding with this group or that group. But the really interesting part of this, and this is pointed out by our friends Apollo Slater and Ray Vahi, that it's actually kind of cool to see how much well-paid research and graphs coming from Soros on how the alt-media is increasing in influence. They've done all the work to show the massive effect that we are having. And I made another episode about some of the ways that we are winning. Latest episode of Good News next week, episode 47, I do believe, West Virginia Weed for the Win. It's also got stories about making glyphosate-free lemonade out of life's lemons, unsettling the elite with talk of menstruation and crowdfunding. And yes, good weed news out of my home state of West Virginia. We're going to dive into that a little more fully on your upcoming segment of the Mary Jane Reports. That Good News Next Week episode, as well as the dozen or so stories we've spent the previous hour talking about, you can find all on our tweet feed. We publish the headlines about an hour before showtime in a Twitter moment. 
so that if you are at your cube and in a position to be able to follow along the show, I've got all the stories we're going to talk about right there for you. Then again, of course, at the end of the episode, we put together the all the show notes of everything we've talked about. Again, everything we say and play always included in the show notes. We're going to go out with brand new music from the Baltimore Boys known as Future Islands. But first, of course, the always important stroll down this day in history, my friends. April 11th, 1961, two interesting events. The trial of Adolf Eichmann begins in Jerusalem, and that same very day, April 11th, 1961, Bob Dylan made his professional singing debut in Greenwich Village. He opened for a guy named John Lee Hooker at Gertie's Folk City. On this day, April 11th, 1966, Frank Sinatra recorded Strangers in the Night. And on April 11th, 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson, in a break between bombing small children in the nation of Vietnam, Cambodia, and beyond, he also took some time off from killing little kids to sign the Civil Rights Act of 1968, prohibiting discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing. April 11, 1979, Ugandan dictator Idi Amin is deposed. An interesting little side musical note in history. Small thing that, of course, has gigantic ripples, at least for music-loving nerds. On this day, April 11th, 1983, Metallica fired Dave Mustaine. On our way out to the East Coast, we were staying at connections of friends and Dave. He was trashing their houses and just really disrespecting stuff. And you know, we drank a lot. God, did we drink a lot. But Dave had sides in when he was drunk that was not positive. I think especially Cliff thought that Dave Mustaine was just like out of his mind. It was going to bring us all down. And we had to put an end to it. If you ever wake up and the other three band members are sitting, you know, within two feet of you, staring at you as you're rubbing sleep out of your eyes, probably not a good sign. And that was what Dave awoke to that morning. We had the bus ticket in hand. Dude, we've got to let you go. Gave him 15 minutes to get his things together and then put him on a bus and then back to California. Probably not the nicest way to do it, but that's all we knew. So me and James got roaringly drunk about 10, 11 in the morning and went sightseeing. Start spreading the news. We went to the top of the Empire State Building and just started drinking. <laughs> and whatever that did for us, it, it, it helped. So two drunken assholes fire third drunken asshole because, you know, three's a crowd. <laughs> hey, but if, if Cliff's not into him, that kind of helps make the decision as well. Looking at this day in history, April 11th, 1986, a gun battle in broad freaking daylight in, of course, America's Wang, down in Dade County, Florida, between two bank armored car robbers and pursuing FBI agents. During the firefight, FBI agents Jerry L. Dove and Benjamin P. Grogan were killed, five other agents wounded. Right in the streets of Miami. April 11th, 1993, 450 prisoners rioted at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville, Ohio, and continued to do so for 10 days, citing grievances related to prison conditions, as well as the forced vaccination of Nation of Islam prisoners you know, for tuberculosis against their religious beliefs. Now, we were taking the break last week, so we didn't actually hit the anniversary day of Kurt Cobain's death, but on this day, April 11th in 1994, a Seattle, Washington coroner ruled that Kurt Cobain's death was a suicide. April 11th, 2002, over 200,000 people marched in Caracas towards the presidential palace to demand the resignation of President Hugo Chavez. 19 protesters killed. And on April 11th, 2006, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, remember him? He announced Iran's claims to have successfully enriched uranium. Now published to MediaMonarchy.com 10 years ago today, I was actually sharing the latest episode of our buddy Alex Ansari, who is pretty much off-grid homestead style, I think, in Colorado these days. On April 11th, 2007, a decade ago today, Alex Ansari spoke with Deborah Garcia about her film, The Future of Food, an excellent expose into the patented seeds owned by Monsanto that were revolutionizing our food supply. So talking about Frankenfoods, 
not only a decade ago, but many years prior to that. That's 10 years ago today on MediaMonarchy.com. And again, we've been online since 9-11-05, and it is brought to you by you. Celebrating birthdays today, are you ready for this? April 11th, Anton LaVey. Jennifer Gray's dad, Joel Gray. Woody Allen's ex-wife, Louise Lasser. It's also crazed director John Milius' birthday. Paul Fox from The Ruts. Neville Staple from The Specials. We've been playing some of his new solo music lately. Jim Lauderdale, Jeremy Clarkson, Vincent Gallo, Lisa Stansfield, Joss Stone, and Zola Jesus. All celebrating birthdays today. Some of those musical folks might weasel their way into our Tech Tuesday edition of your daily DJ set at noon. We are wrapping up your morning monarchy right here. And then we'll immediately start prepping our daily DJ set at noon. Hey, if you dig these shows, why don't you tell a friend about it? We are fear-free, listener-supported, independent, non-commercial alternative media, and we are brought to you by you, and I love it, and I appreciate it. Future Islands dropped their brand-new record last Friday. They're going to hit Coachella, and then, of course, Massive Tour. We're going to hear a new song from Future Islands, the boys from Baltimore, a little song called Ran. That wraps up your Tech Tuesday Cyberspace War edition of your Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, thanking you so much for listening and reminding you, as always, my friends, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.